This is the second of two lectures that I'm giving looking at Sabah Mahmoud's ideas about the intersections between politics and religion and the ways that Western secular ideas about politics and religion have actually, um, I'd say, shifted or possibly mutated what actually could be real in terms of a political life in other countries that are not Western. And this section is going to be looking at Western secular theology, this idea that Mahmoud argues that secularism is itself religious and has its own theological frameworks. Now, Mahmoud addressed the controversy of the Danish magazine, which in 2008 caricatured the prophet Muhammad. Um, and this is offensive to Muslims because it represented the prophet in a very unflattering light and offensive because it represented the prophet visually. Islamic tradition forbids visual representations of the prophet or of Allah as well. This issue was presented in 2008 as a battle between the liberal value of universal free speech for all versus the taboos of just one specific religious community. And Mahmoud again argues that by making that the binary and the argument and the fight, you miss all the complexities in what was actually going on. So Mahmoud argued that this was not a clash between this inherent opposites of neutral universal value and a particular tradition, on the other hand, as the concept of universal free speech depends upon a particular, a specific Western Protestant Christian framework of the norms and values of society and what religion should look like in a society. This wasn't simply holding the line on free speech against fundamentalist myopia, or even a liberal Western failure to live up to its own values of tolerance and respect of religions. Instead, the framework fails because one, it doesn't, it doesn't think critically about the kinds of reasoning behind Muslims' pain about mocking the prophet, and it sidesteps the examination of the moral claims and religious histories that underlie the entire construct of free speech. Now, Mahmoud acknowledges that many Muslims weren't bothered by the images, but dismisses the lack of offense as an argument against any Muslim taking offense. Just because some weren't bothered doesn't mean that we should just ignore the idea that Muslims possibly had a point in being bothered and offended. There is an inability to comprehend on the Western secular side of this, that there are forms of moral injury. Moral injury is an injury to an individual's moral conscience and values, resulting from an act of perceived moral transgression, which produces profound emotional guilt and shame. And in some cases, also a sense of betrayal, anger, and profound moral disorientation. Okay, so that's moral injury. She argues there is an inability to comprehend that there are forms of moral injury which do not conform to liberal secular notions of law, civility, and offense. There is a secular theology which underlies the concept of free speech. This manifests in an ideology of language and signs, a secular semiotic ideology, semiotic is just a relating to signs and their meaning, which only sees arbitrary connections between signs and icons, symbols, and the concepts they represent. So thus, in the Western idea, a picture of Muhammad is not really Muhammad himself, just as the same would be for Jesus. In this construction, language is just mainly the representation of objects and the communication of meaning as images of Muhammad do not compose the entirety of his meaning as a person, the image, according to the West, does not constitute an affront to his person. Yet this view depends on the assumption that the true locus or root center foundation of religion is inside the person, an inner life. It assumes the individual. 
It assumes that religion is in the end simply an individual choice. As religion is thus purely private, and just a choice anyway, according to the West, the modern person must be capable to separate one's inner feelings, notions, and belief, you know, the world that's just in one's head, from the external world of the real, which is materials, objects, images, etc. Failure to do so, to separate one's inner belief from the world, is thus framed as a failure to be modern or rational or any of those other kinds of ideas. Any beliefs which impinge on this secular framework are thus seen as distractions, curiosities from another time, or even just backwards. Yet reverence for Muhammad in Islam isn't simply a matter of individual choice, like one aspect in a cafeteria buffet line, choosing one belief from here, practice from there, crafting one's own personal private belief system. Muhammad is actually the embodiment of the Muslim life lived perfectly. Using the concept of skesis, or cohabitation, Mahmud explains that a Muslim venerates Muhammad in order to live life as he did, to actually inhabit his body. So coming back to the previous part, the, the, the first part of this lecture, in a way, by trying to act and, and live as this venerated person is, they're trying to thus make the kinds of habitus, the kinds of discipline, which will make them into someone who is akin to Muhammad. They, in some sense, Muslims venerate Muhammad to live a life as he did, to actually inhabit his body. Muslims strive to become Muhammad, and thus to bring their beliefs and practices into perfect alignment in a life, which embodies the Prophet's perfect alignment. In a way, to lampoon the Prophet is to lampoon the Muslim and her entire community. So Mahmud insists that seeking redress from the law, as some Muslims did, seeking to enshrine attacks against Islam as racism and hate speech, was bound to encounter challenges as they did because one, the prejudice of the European majority is definitely against Islam. European people, the majority of people, European people at this time in this space were Islamophobic, Mahmoud argues. Two, the fact that majorities define what is and is not legal. And three, that secular liberal law has no way to make sense of religion beyond simply a private matter. Western law is incapable of grasping then what Islam actually means. So Mahmoud argues that secularism is inextricable to liberal political rule and as such enshrines the religious norms of the majority in state institutions, laws, practices. While political liberalism disavows religion from the public sphere, which is the, you know, the framework, at least in the West, it actually relies on categories which were originally religious. So paradoxically, therefore, liberal secularism actually imports, takes on a very specific set of religious beliefs, frameworks, and practices into the exercise of political and judicial power. And therefore, the secular is, in a way, actually religious. And there is a contradictory tension at work in the strong liberal impulse to regulate public and private life, while seemingly making the continual promise of freedom, but only a certain kind of freedom. Now, two categories of political secularism, religious liberty and minority rights, are not actually universally applicable moral principles, according to Mahmoud. Instead, they are strategies for liberal governance to regulate and, and manage religious difference. By pushing religious groups into separate, these little tiny minority ghettos, these sort of communities off by themselves, actually exacerbates difference, makes it worse, and, ex and, and, and heightens tensions within a society because it creates distinct groups which wrestle with each other political access, control, and recognition of their own individual power and rights. You create different groups that have to fight each other over the same pie. This also grants the, straight, the, the, the state tremendous power, for it becomes the center from which the right to be and to exist as a person in totality, including religious life, flows. 
The state literally thus holds the power of life, death, and meaning. Because it says what rights you have and how you are able to exercise them. Secularity demands, according to Mahmoud, that we accept how it frames all aspects of existence, including time. Secularism's visions of history as an exact factual narrative of a linear progression of time moving all, ever forward, composed scientific precision, grants value to very specific understandings of historical truth, and thus what we assign value to. This has had a profound impact on how religious truth is evaluated and assigned value. Religious traditions are forced to confront each other in the public sphere using liberal secular frameworks and rules, not their own, not the mm -hmm you know, rules and frameworks coming from the own tradition. They have to define them, reshape them so that they fit into liberal secularism's frameworks and rules. And then they have to then basically argue with other parts in the public sphere. Now, Mahmoud sort of has two quotes which sort of sum up this argument. One, the modern conception of history as an autonomous mode of inquiry into the positivity of events as they occur in linear time is a key feature of secularity that has had an enormous influence in how religious truth is interpreted and justified in the modern world. Basically, what I said before, but that's what she said. Secularity flattens religious incommensurability, forcing religious traditions to confront one another in the uniform space of history, all equally vulnerable to the questioning power of the second. So what I said in the last 12 minutes, but in her terms. Now Mahmoud argues that the US government has had a particular interest in identifying, supporting, and granting power to what it terms moderate Islam and moderate Muslim allies. This desire to moderate Islam stems from a desire to value frameworks of Islam and Muslim identity, which A, fit secular definitions of a proper relationship between religion and state, and B, are best suited for the exercise of U.S. interests and power in predominantly Muslim countries. Excuse me one second. This quest necessitates creating definitional boundaries of, and then rendering judgments on, good and bad Muslims and Islam. This rested on a specific model of scriptural hermeneutics. Good Islam, and thus Muslim allies, view the Quran as simply a historical literary text bound by the same conventions and interpreted according to the same methods as any other historical literary text in Western secular Protestantism. The Bible is viewed as a crafted historical document bound by context and thus able to be critiqued or even have parts dismissed or ignored should modern sensibilities demand such. Whereas a bad Muslim refuses to play this game and insists on viewing the Quran as a whole and perfect and indivisible word of Allah. Now, that is a framework. It also has been heavily critiqued and look to Mahmoud's readings to get a better sense of how that whole thing has been critiqued, but it has certainly been critiqued. 